This week on Free Range Sailing, we make the necessary upgrades to our dinghy. It's basically pulling the car. In the process, learning a lot about working with epoxy and fiberglass from our new friend David, whose catamaran stole the show last week. We've had a lot of questions about our experiences with the Porterboat dinghy, so stay tuned because in a few days we'll be releasing another video addressing its pros and cons. One of the folder boat seats, well actually both of them are gone, but this is probably the worst. So we can see that this crack has really gone crazy. This one as well, and it's basically falling apart. So inside a folder boat seat, um, rather than just using a, a bit of ply, um, these things have actually got a bit of foam inside them. And they don't do that for fun. All right, um, a dinghy's supposed to have a bit of reserve buoyancy so it doesn't sink if you flood it. So we're going to try and preserve a bit of that and um, we've met David here and he's off camera at the moment. Um, we're sort of deferring to his expertise and hopefully as I learn something you can too because we're going to make some out of this polycore. Alright, so it's just uh, basically an expanded, how would you, what would you call it? It's expanded plastic? It's HDPE honeycomb. It is, HDPE. HDPE is high density polyethylene and it's a honeycomb of it, um, no bees. So David's previously, this is normally soft, he's already glassed and resined this. And we're going to cut it out, cut it to shape, get the thickness right, put the legs back on and get rid of these somehow. Let's get into it. All right, so we said that polycore is essentially plastic beehive, um, plastic when it's high density polyethylene. So you can see the little cells there, all right, where the little bees would be. Um, but that gives you a better view, doesn't it? All right. So these are some that David's cut up and he actually using packing tape here as not really a release agent, but a material that is uh, releases from resin very well. So this is good for flexible molds on edges. So there's a lot that we're learning here and that's, that's one of the more useful ones. Actually, the packing tape can be, can be used to release resin. Before starting on the seats, we discussed various types of fiberglass available. This is called double bias glass because it has a diagonal weave on each side giving enormous strength. We decided to include some in our stores in case we need to do some hull repairs. David also showed us some carbon fibre mat which can be used in the same way as fiberglass but it is even stronger. Our seats were made from offcuts, so we had to join them to get the lengths required. Often when I've been doing a project before, um, when I've had the luxury, I've always, if you start a project with one measuring device or a couple, stick with it. And Lufkin's a really good brand, so David hasn't skimped on anything here. But when you're gonna go and buy new measuring devices, um, get one that you've paid good money for and you know is accurate, you can take it with you. Um, and actually measure them in the shop and make sure they agree because there's no guarantee. Uh, manufacturing standards rise and fall in time and you might, uh, you might get a tape measure that isn't, each millimetre is not or each inch is not the same as what your favourite ruler is and if you're doing a little bit of work you might be measuring up mitres and you go, well, why the hell doesn't it all match up? And I'm talking from experience here, it's because one of your measuring devices can be just a shade out. Okay, just as an aside, sometimes you might get hold of a tape measure and go, oh, look, the bloody the tongue's all loose and everything else like that. It's supposed to be, okay? If you're ever wondering why, um, the reason it's loose is because it's loose to the same width of what that tongue is. And that's so, if you measure it that way, as long as you push it firmly, get your measurement and mark on the outside, or if you use it and hook it over the edge and then move it like that, you'll get the same measurement all the time. So that is not a bug, it's a feature. What is it? It's a polyester tap, mm -hmm. uh, silicon free. Um, if you have silicon in, in your peel ply, it's going to cause problems when you when you actually use it. What actually happens with the with the peel ply is that once we've wetted out this glass that you've just cut out, mm -hmm. we put a layer of peel ply on top of that and roll that out on top of the wet fiberglass. Yep. Once the fiberglass cures and the epoxy cures, we'll take the peel ply off and it leaves a nice smooth finish uh, for the next stage. 
you still need to be a little bit sanded and a bit keyed up for the next for the next stage, but it provides you with a nice smooth finish to sell off so you don't end up with fibers from the glass standing up. Right. Um, which means more work, more bog, whatever. So yeah, it's you'll see it. Save a few we, hours, huh? It saves a bit of time and also you can just look if you if you've glassed this, this up and you're not going to need to get to the next stage for a while, you leave it on. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's only when you ne ne get to the next stage of your build that you then take it off and key it up for whatever you need it, okay. need, need it for. So it keeps what you've done clean. Take it off, you've got a nice clean surface because it takes any rubbish, any dust that's landed on it over the course of the build, takes it off with it. What do you know, you said silicon free and made a point of mentioning it. Mm -hmm. What happens if it's not? Uh, it contaminates your epoxy and not good. Good answer. Right. With the planning done, it was time to get cutting. Happier? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Like any building project with timber or fiberglass, you can't have enough clamps. Our technique for joining the seat planks was to use thickened epoxy as a glue and then make the join with two layers of double bias fibreglass wet through with unthickened epoxy. In the past, like everyone else, I've used brushes and I've consigned a few of these rollers to the bin through not cleaning them properly in it. I have used in the past vinegar, all right, you can use vinegar to clean up epoxy. David's advice was using a toothbrush and a bit of metho. Now he's built a mighty catamaran out there and look, impossible you might think, but it's still going. <laughs> this thing was there from the start. And a scraper, not paintbrushes. We'll see how it works. But first, David showed us the epoxy additive he uses. In the green container on the left was cotton flock and cabocil, which is for gluing. And in the bucket on the right was cabocil and Q-cells used for fairing. Now we will be using some of this and you'll see the difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the in how hard it goes. I mean, this goes rock hard. Yep. Okay. And it's virtually impossible to pull, pull it apart once you get it going. Expensive. Yes. The cabbage, the, 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 the cotton flock amazed me how expensive it was. Mm. And I, as I said, it's cheesy charge a lot for sweepings off the cotton mill floor. But anyway, and you just buy it. You literally buy it in a bag. It looks like a bag of cotton fluff. So what we've just been informed then, and this was new to me, was one-to-one -one glass to resin for wetting out. If you've got one gram of fiberglass, you need one gram of resin, roughly, to, uh, to wet it out, so measure it up. The way I go about it is I add the hardener first and then I add the resin because I find it's easier because it's a four-to-one mix. Mm. If I'm just slightly over in the, in the hardener, I know I've just got to add another four grams of the, right. of the resin. Whereas if I put my resin in first and then I go over with the hardener, then I'm playing catch up all the time. Looks okay. great, sir. When mixing epoxy and the catalyst, you want to be very thorough. Make sure that you get every corner, and when you think you've stirred it enough, just stir it some more. Only then do you add the thickener to get the consistency that you want for the project. So we're mixing this up. Uh, my instructions are thick honey. Often hear people say mix it up to peanut butter, but that's more for fairing and uh, gluing and stuff like that. For this, David says thick honey for this particular one. We were using epoxy thickened with cotton flock and cabocil to create glue. Clamping it to boards ensured straight, flat seats and then, under David's careful eye, Troy scraped off the excess glue ready to fiberglass. Okay, so we've put the thickened epoxy in now. Um, and that's just, it sort of fills up the gap so there'll be no leaking down in there. Um, it's not actually acting that much to, to glue the two together. We're going to have fiberglass on top and bottom and that's what we're going to do now. So we're going to get the actual fiberglass, put it on, we're going to wet that out. That'll be left tonight and then tomorrow it gets flipped and the other side gets done the same. We're putting it on while this is still wet now. So it's a chemical bond as David put it. All right, so the epoxy is going on. It's another wet thing. Molecules can interact with each other and you get a much stronger bond. This, um, this amount of resin that we've mixed up is only for this particular one? This for this? No, no, it's for both. For both, both yeah. You'll be amazed how far it'll go. You know, I was sceptical that we had enough resin, but of course, once again, David was absolutely right. 
David informed us it was important to use two different size sheets of fibreglass to get a tapered finish on the join and avoid hard spots which might promote cracking. That scraper, there's not much rolling to. <coughs> True. Like but it's, it's really wet through really well. Yeah, I still like to do it just in case. When rolling out wet fiberglass, you'll know you've done a good job when it becomes transparent. The last step was to roll out some peel ply until it was uniformly wet through with resin. I feel like I did it. It's done. It's all good. Two thumbs up. Okay. Now we just leave that go. Yeah, I think that's the end of it. Alright, so we've had a bit of a look. So one of the benefits of David's knowledge that we're getting is the peel ply that we discussed earlier. So this is, it just comes straight off. It'll be like Christmas, unwrapping. And I can see that that's really smooth, and here it's quite rough. And so over a large project, say building a 45 foot catamaran, 40 foot catamaran, that would save you an enormous amount of bogging and sanding. So this stuff is, well it's a lesson, it's worth learning. So that's a really nice smooth finish, that would just need a little bit of sanding, um, and then just whatever your final finishing treatment would be, yeah. So this is the stage we're at. We did that fill, we did the glass, we peel plied it, um, and it's looking smooth. It's done on both sides. It's already looking pretty strong, um, but now it needs to be cut to side and this edge needs to be treated. All right, we've got a table saw of sorts. Um, David set this up just pretty much spot on. Just the teeth just showing above the bit that you're gonna cut. I know, all right, there's some people out there and they might take umbrage to the fact that we're putting the main work bit between the blade and the fence, but this stuff's incredibly light. It's not like we're cutting hardwood. So um, I am aware that conventionally we'd have it the other way, but this way it's just, it's, it's gonna be a lot better. No matter what you do with the table, so you're gonna get some, uh, some of the work cut between the fence and usually people don't like the bigger part. So if it's in the comment section, I'll understand. <laughs> The other thing I like to do is just make sure it's got to press the stop here. I'm going to just turn it on, it's not my machine, so just a, a quick test is, does it stop when it's supposed to? Alright, we've established that both seats are the same size, front and back for the, well, front and middle for the porter boat. Um, so instead of measuring again, I'm just going to take it off the existing seat because we've established it's right. A lot of the early shipwrights weren't literate and they weren't very good numerically and they had things like story sticks. So when you were building, you would actually go through, get the measurements and you would go along and you'd make some little notation or whatever that would make sense to you of all the little bits that you had to go and cut and make on a boat. So you might say, okay, I need this for a gusset, this for something else, this for something else to make notes. And you'd go off and cut it because you could just directly compare. So early shipwrights weren't always measuring stuff and if you can get away with making multiple measurements, just mark things from length, you make less mistakes. Not only did we have to get the length of the seats right, but the ends had to be cut on an angle so they matched the shape of the sides of our dinghy. This polycore, once it's been, um, you know, once it's been glassed and you're ready to go and you do treat the edges, David likes to route out these so it's back to the fiberglass and that leaves you with this edge. Um, and it, he's quite a meticulous man, I like his way of doing it. So what has, what, when it gets to that stage, we're going to fill it with resin and then we'll have this treatment here. And then once that's set, then we can, again, put the bog in there, put these forms in so they're nice and smooth and we'll get a really nice smooth finish. And that's the step that we're tackling right now. The easiest way to core the edge is with a small router. That's the consistency. Yeah. It's not going anywhere, is it? So you say run it in and then push it against the edge. Yep. Yeah, that's it. So the important thing to, to aim for here is to get it right down into those honeycomb cores. 
got mm -hmm. it filled. Now just going to run the corner down. So the rationale behind that, it'll, it'll stiffen up the edge for the next step. And also this V that we've put in there um, just gives us a better surface for the, for the final treatment and then it will end up that nice flush surface. Once the initial concave filler layout was set, then we put on a second layer left a little proud, ready for this next step. Obviously tape down, put it on top and we press it down just a little bit. Grab this into the middle, put it over the top, pull it down like that, push it down. And what that then does, squeezes out the bog. All right, and then we'll just do two more, one there, one there, and then let it, let it cure, done. Oh, so this, it oozes onto this it's more than it does onto that. Yeah, very <laughs> cunning. <laughs> Yeah, okay. That's great. And if you get it, in fact, if you get it right and you untape it at the right time, it's still a little bit rubbery, but it still doesn't, it won't, it won't pull lift. out. And all I did then is get a sharp, sharp, um, um, like a standing off or something. Not even stand. I use an old scraper, which is pretty sharp. Mm -hmm. and I just run it along the edge and it just, just pulls it straight off. Yeah, nice. Bam. Okay, so fast forward into the future. So all of this has had the back filling and it's just been, it's had a roundover, what's that, a six mil roundover? Yeah. A six mil roundover to clean it up and there's our seats. So as David pointed out, we're going to be sitting about this much lower. This width is just to go into the channel of the, of the porter boat and you'll see that in a bit later. So today's plan is we're going to locate the holes for these legs and they can't just be anywhere because where these go determines the shape of the porter boat so we need to get it fairly right what we're going to do drill all those out then we've got a nice bit of paper we're going to put that over with pencils just find where the holes are and make a drilling stencil because um, as you get older and more cunning forget about measuring if you possibly can We also needed to put the seats in place and mark up where the holes for those keeper pins had to go. Next we wanted to make epoxy cores to screw the leg supports into and David showed us his method. We were using a small hole saw but we were careful not to go all the way through stopping at the layer of glass on the other side of the poly core. Once the drilling was done then the waste was pulled out with a small set of pliers leaving a hole for the epoxy resin. Some of them come out easy and some of them don't. So David's taking special care to get all the way through. Resin, the epoxy resin won't stick that great to this stuff. Okay, HDPE is it's nice and slippery. So we're getting all the way through to the bottom of the resin and then it'll, it'll fill out and make a nice core and it won't be going anywhere. The seats holding pins had to go through their hole at the correct angle. After drilling a pilot hole at that angle, we could then use the hole saw to follow it through. Okay, so we've drilled all these out and the same thing's going to happen on here, slightly different. Um, and we're going to fill them with epoxy and then we can, we can screw them in, just like these other seats. You might go, gee, that's a lot of work. But you know what, if you've got a sailing boat and it's got a balsa core or marine core on the coach top and you want to install fittings, you really are supposed to be doing that. I know a lot of people just drill through and go for Sikaflex and I've done it as well. But particularly with balsa core and if you've got a foam core boat, you really should be doing exactly what we're doing here. Drilling out a core, backfilling with epoxy, then drilling that and screwing into that. Um, lots and lots of boats have got, got their share of cancer from people just relying on Sikaflex instead of doing the, the real deal. So there you go. It looks like a little bit of trouble, but it's the right way to do it. And the right way to do it is often just a little bit more trouble. Here you can see David using a plastic bag as a homemade resin dispenser, as well as his efficiency of movement. And it's all of these things that speaks to his extensive knowledge of working with fiberglass.
To reinforce the hole for the seat's keeper pins, David wanted to glue in these aluminium sleeves. One of his great tips was to use hot glue to secure parts of your project until the epoxy has set them permanently into place. Seemingly, according to David, nothing can be too strong. He couldn't resist reinforcing our seats with carbon fibre, leaving us with probably the fanciest porterboat seats in the world. While carbon fibre may seem space age, it can be just as simple to use as fiberglass. Okay, one of the engineering innovations um, that's part of the folding boat is just so they don't have a, a solid transom that you have to take out and it's a storage issue is this, is this folding transom. It's not a bad idea, but over the years of pretty hard use, it has to be admitted, um, it's shown up a few, a few faults. So we can see if we look at the back here at the same time, these, these channels that make up the backbone of it, they are mostly riveted in. They're, they're, there's a few little pan head bolts here, um, but they fail, all right? So what I'm actually going to do is at each end of the channel, look, right in the end, right in the middle, and then this last one here, I'm gonna replace them with six mil or quarter inch machine screws with a nylock nut. I'll continue using rivets down in the middle, but those ones seem to have the most stress and the rivets often fail. And when they do, that metal comes apart, the angle, and it chatters against itself and it makes a really horrible noise as well as just generally wearing on the boat and the other thing is on this particular channel here I've had to in the past get another bit of aluminium angle and extend it and that was when we were in Darwin when we were in Darwin Pascal how long ago uh, eight months ago eight months ago so in those eight months of use this stuff again it's completely completely RS really so we're just going to get another heavier bit of angle um, and again I'm going to put the, the 6mm stainless screws. I bought 6mm stainless steel 316 screws and that means I'm going to have to put a little bit of a compound on there to stop any electrolysis. But that's pretty much the upgrade that we're going to do as well as doing the seats. What can I say, the rest of the boat has been well incredibly tough. We still don't have any leaks in it. It's made out of polypropylene and polypropylene is used in industry to make what's called a living hinge. And what a living hinge is, if you, you know your, your pill containers or anything, where you can pop the top and then close it again. If you did that with any type of metal and a lot of plastics, it would become work hard and brittle and come apart. Polypropylene doesn't do that, so that's why this thing can keep folding and opening and everything else like that. It's, um, if you want to do repairs on this, you don't have to use um, Sikaflex or you don't have to use glues or anything like that. You can heat this stif stuff up and another bit of polypropylene, which is really common. I think it's uh, the recycling triangle with five in it. I'll, I'll check it out. But you can heat those two things up and glue it there and it will weld really, really strongly. So even if we do get a hole in here, I'm pretty sure that we could just wander one of the local beaches, find some plastic rubbish that washes up. Everyone's gnashing their teeth about it at the moment, but I guess there is just a very, very tiny silver lining to that cloud. And we could have repaired the boat with literally a hot coal out of the fire and some rubbish that we picked up off the shoreline. But we haven't had to just yet. So this has been its Achilles heel really. We've destroyed the seats and the transom has had to have a few a few running repairs. What do you think, Pasky? anything else? The flotation foam? Um, it's touted as being UV stable, but I don't know if it is. All right, this stuff has been flaking off and coming apart. The back part's ripped off. It generally looks pretty scabby. Um, I don't want to point the finger too much. These people, they wanted to keep costs down, keep weight down, but they needed by law of a lot of different countries to have reserve buoyancy in their boat. So this was their solution, as well as the foam filled seats. All right, so rivets are gone. Floppy as anything. So we just need to take out these last ones here. And we're just gonna go and make up a whole new section out of thicker alley. Cutting the new braces to length was straightforward, but we also had to mark out and cut slots in the aluminium.
Okay, so we managed to get all the holes in the right spot. To everyone's surprise, we've got our grooves cut and they work. So now I'm just gonna I'm just gonna um, use some six mil, <laughs> all right? Some nice big heavy uh, or quarter inch if you like um, stainless bolts. Now because this is aluminium and this is stainless steel, you would have corrosion issues down the track. So because we're using dissimilar metals, and also because I'm using 316 and 316 nuts and similar metals as well, we need a little bit of chemical assistance. Um, TEF gel, I really like it. Okay, so what it does is it creates a barrier between dissimilar metals, the stainless steel and the aluminium, because normally this would act to corrode the aluminium. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look at elect uh, electrolysis between dissimilar metals. But also with stainless steels, if you are tightening a nut on a bolt, you can get what's called galling. Tiny little fragments of stainless steel will come off, jam in there, and the heat generated by the torque, the force of joining them together, you can actually weld the steels together and you won't be able to get it undone and you completely bugger up the threads. So this will sort out both of those issues, okay? It'll stop electrolysis between dissimilar metals, but it will also stop galling between your stainless. These are nylocks, so once we've done them up, we shouldn't have to touch them again and they'll be resistant to coming undone by vibration. And because they're six mil, they shouldn't snap, break, come off at all. Good surface area in that head and a nice big fat washer as well. So hopefully this will be the fix to end all fixes. <laughs> so to use this stuff is not very difficult at all. The squeeze it out, they tell me that it's non-toxic so that's really great. Absolutely non-toxic to people or marine ec ecosystems. So just spooge a bit on. It's nice and gooey. And put it around. It doesn't harden, okay? It's not gonna act as a glue, but it will stop the exchange of electrons, if you like, between these two metals. And that exchange of electrons will corrode the aluminium and reinforce the stainless steel. It won't help. And then whack it through the hole, put the washer on and tighten her up and that should be done. Oh, look at that. I'm just going to give the back side of this washer a bit where it's going to contact the aluminium. Where is it? I can't do it by feel. There we are. And in terms of galling, I mean, you can just throw a little bit just in there, and that is a that is a done job, really. Nice and smooth. All right, so we've done it. Um, we replaced one, and we just figured we'd replace the other one because we could. And David was being generous with his aluminium. So that's it. Now we have a much, much stronger transom in our porter boat. This is, well, each bit's twice as thick as this stuff, which means like all together, you know, it's a, it's a pretty beefy old transom now. Yeah, it's rock solid. And it being aluminium, it's not like it's gonna weigh it down a ton, is it? Like if I'd replaced it with stainless steel or something crazy. So all of these things now have, uh, have TEF gel on them, lock nuts, no more rivets. I'm looking forward to a lot more reliability out of it. When we left, things looked a lot different. So since then, um, this has all been fared and coved, so it's nicely rounded. We inserted those aluminium pieces, they've been uh, set in and clothed. Um, I, should, I shouldn't be saying it's just happened. Of course, David's done it in our absence. Um, nicely fared. And this textured paint has gone on. What's this called, David? Hemoclad. Hemoclad. So this will be a, it's a, a thick, sort of a plastic sort of paint. It's gone on with a rough roller. So we won't slip when um, Pascal's fighting with queenfish or some other massive thing. So they're getting very, very close to being done. Now we just need to drill pilot holes in for when we want to screw the, the, uh, the brackets to take the legs. So we're putting pilot holes, then these can be painted and of course we'll be able to find those holes again because a little divot of paint will show us where we're going to go. So we're getting, we're getting pretty close to, to done. Um, so they're, they're light, okay, very, very similar, um, but we've maintained our buoyancy. Remember, that's what we said uh, from the start. This is, this is quite, uh, let's say, a more professional job than I might have endeavoured to do. 
but we're going to have a lot more buoyancy than if we'd used just say a bit of marine ply from the local hardware store and just whacked it together. So these are these are something else really. Onwards. So we've got our set square and we've got this little as a stencil because uh, you might not think so with this porter boat, everything's down to the last millimetre. I mean look, if we don't get it spot on, it's just not going to fit. Yeah, probably. That's <laughs> Probably, it's probably nonsense, isn't it? There's plenty of uh, there's plenty of plenty of movement, plenty of play in a border boat. It's not rocket surgery. One more thing, Pascal's just about to charge into this, but just so that she knows the depth, we've just put a bit of masking tape there as a marker, and so we know that all our pilot holes are going to be the same depth. I was I did it just kind of the dodgy way, and just she'll be right. But um, Pascal's a bit more of a precision operator than I am. Well, she's so. more likely to <laughs> stuff it up. So. Come on, Dale. <laughs> All right, there you go. Thanks. You're on. It's not because there's a loose nut on the handle. How you going there, Pascal? What do you reckon? Mm, I reckon I'm not very good at painting. Well, wink, wink. I think you just need more practice. <laughs> oh no! A lot more practice. <laughs> like a whole boat's worth of practice. We'll see that in Townsville. Do you reckon I'll come out a pro? So. Yeah. I'm not sure how Marul will come out, but you'll come out good. <laughs> <laughs> So these are our seats. A much thinner profile. They're white, so they shouldn't burn the bum. Got this textured surface. <laughs> they're solid, all right. So, and because they're made of that polycore, they'll be very, very buoyant. So this is just this is just covered in that that textured paint. So it's got a bit of a, a bit of a plastic feel to it, but definitely non-slip. With the pilot holes drilled earlier by Pascal, it was a simple matter for me to screw in the leg supports. With the new seats installed, it was time for a strength test and we were thrilled at a job well done and a new friend made. Now that the dinghy had new seats, the old black buoyancy foam looked particularly ratty. It's essential to keep the design buoyancy from a safety point of view, so we replaced it with some closed cell foam sewed into this sleeve of Sunbrella acrylic canvas, and we bolted it to the gunnels of our dinghy to ensure that it would never sink. The finishing touch were these stainless steel acorn nuts to avoid cuts and scratches, and to make our dinghy just a little more fancy. Thank you for tuning into Free Range Sailing. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, as it really helps get our video out to more viewers. If you'd like to keep track of us in real time, there is links in the description to our Facebook and Instagram page, as well as loads of other great information that you might find useful.